the identification, about 180 years ago, of a Viking age in Scandinavia fired the creative imaginations of novelists and painters alike. The Swedish novelist Asaias Tegner's Fridtjof Saga became a bestseller throughout Europe on its publication in 1820 and inspired a wave first of antiquarian and then of literary and historical interest in the large body of Old Norse saga literature. Artists such as Johannes Flintow, T. N. Arbo and Anker Lund base their careers on illustrations of scenes and characters from the sagas. Their efforts gave a strong but still only tentative legitimacy to the idea of a Viking age for the less romantically inclined. However, something more was needed to confirm the Viking Age as a culture or civilization so distinct as to warrant separate naming. When confirmation came it did so dramatically in the form of a short series of archaeological discoveries made in Norway in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The first of three Viking Age longships, which emerged from more than 1,000 years of obscure Anchorage in Siberial Mounds in the rural southeast of Norway was the Tune ship, unearthed at Rolvesi in Astfold in 1867 and dated to about 900. A rectangular grave chamber behind the mast housed the remains of a man, along with a horse, sword, spears and the remnants of a saddle. The discovery caused much excitement and provided significant new information about the construction of the Viking longships. Already familiar from saga literature and tapestries, and soon to become the defining symbol of the Viking Age. Thirteen years later another ship discovered inside a mound at Sandar in Vestfold, known as the Goxted Ship, overshadowed the Toon Fine, a medical examination. Carried out in 2007 by Professor Per Holk of the University of Oslo's anatomy department, of the remains from the ship's grave chamber revealed a very different picture from that presented by a study carried out shortly after the initial discovery which had suggested a man of between 50 and 70, so badly afflicted by rheumatism that he was probably bedridden and scarcely able to feed himself. Professor Hulk's results show that the occupant was an extremely powerful and muscular man in his 40s. At about 181 centimeters in height, he would have towered some 15 centimeters above the average man of his time. His thigh bones alone weighed 30% more than the average for men of a similar height in modern times, a development suggesting that he spent much of his time on horseback, with his thigh muscles in constant use as they pressed in against the flanks of his mount. Neurologists at the Oslo National Hospital also found that he had a pituitary adenoma, or tumor of the pituitary gland, that led to an increased production of growth hormone and probably gave him the physical characteristics associated with gigantism. Appropriately enough, this first real Viking had died a violent death. Professor Hulk suggests a sequence of events in which the Goxted chieftain was ambushed by two or perhaps three assailants. A blow with a sword to the left leg, just below the kneecap, would have left him unable to stand. The left knee was then attacked a second time with some kind of club hammer, and the outer part of the right ankle was sliced off in the heat of the struggle. A stab wound in the right thigh struck perilously close to the main artery, and these for wounds from three different weapons were enough to kill him. A dozen horses had been buried with him, along with six dogs and a peacock, five beds, three small boats, a bronze pot with suspension chain, a barrel, buckets, and sixty-four shields with traces of yellow and black paint on them that had been fastened to that. Outside of the ship's rail, the ten-shaped grave chamber containing the skeleton had been built using notched logs, laugh technican. It remains the only physical proof that this particular woodworking technique was known to the Vikings. The Goxted ship itself was overshadowed by the discovery of the even more richly furnished and exquisite Osberg ship at Slagen in Vestfold in 1904. Unlike other mounds in the area on the western bank of the Oslo Roard, like those at Boran Farm and Schaugen near Teenspear, there was no tradition associating the mound on Oscar Rom's farm with a burial site. It was known locally as Revahagen, meaning a place where foxes were to be found. In the wake of the huge national and international interest aroused by the Goxted Fine, there had been a certain amount of active looking for ship burial sites in Norway. Rom had done some desultory digging in Revahagen and found something he thought might be interesting, and on the 8th of August 1903 he traveled to Oslo to show it to Professor Gabriel Gustafsson. The curator of the university's Museum of Antiquities, Gustafsson was initially skeptical of Rom's claim, but the moment Rom showed him the small sample of carved wood he had brought along with him from the mound his skepticism vanished. Two days later he visited the site himself and dug a provisional shaft, 
which persuaded him of the importance and size of the discovery. It was too late in the year to begin a full excavation, so he closed the shaft to protect the find from frost and spent the winter making practical and financial preparations for carrying out the work of unearthing it, less than a year later, on the 13th of June 1904. With all the necessary financial support in place, excavation of the mound began. The mound was some 40 meters in diameter and rose to a height of 2.5 meters above the surrounding field. Having collapsed from an estimated original height of about 6.5 meters, the summer turned out to be a dry one, which was good news for the excavating team. It made the digging easier, and justified a decision to dam the nearby stream and run hose pipes from it to keep the ship water. The first significant find came within a few days. When the ship's intricately carved stern post emerged, it was a harbinger of how crucial the discovery of this grave and its contents would be for the creation of the Viking Age. For here was artwork that complemented and instantly expanded existing conceptions of Viking art, which, until then, had been based on small finds of jewelry, the carvings on Swedish rune stones, the Gotland picture stones, and the designs and illustrations used by carvers on the doors of Norwegian stave churches, which were from a later, post-Christian period. It was soon clear that the vessel was broken and much distorted from the pressure of the piled earth. This had forced the lower part of it down into the soft clay beneath, breaking the keel in the middle and forcing up the gravic hammer, positioned, like that of the goxted chamber, behind the mast, until it was higher than the railing. Inside it were two beds in which the two female occupants of the grave had originally been placed. At an unknown date the grave had been entered and their remains removed from the beds by intruders, who had left the bones scattered in the entry shaft. The smaller finds, too, were fragile, often in pieces, and saturated with moisture. Each item that emerged was packed in wet moss and sent to Oslo by weekly shipment. A wooden chest that had lain undisturbed for 1,000 years opened smoothly on its hinges at the first attempt. There was rope all over the deck of the ship. With these smaller items out of the way, it was time to raise the ship itself. Nikolai Nikolaisen, the archaeologist in charge of the Goxted excavation, had been lucky, apart from a clean central break. His ship had been in one piece and cutting through the break had made it an easy, if laborious, task to transport the ship to Oslo into manageable hats. The Osberg ship, by contrast, had retained its basic shape but in shattered form. It was like a giant jigsaw puzzle. A marine engineer was given the task of identifying and marking each of the 2,000 or so pieces as they came up. By the 5th of November the digging was completed and the ship followed the smaller finds up the road to Oslo where the task of reconstruction began. The most urgent need was to preserve the individual parts of the find from decay. Much of the oak used to build the ship had survived in reasonable condition and could be treated with linseed oil and carbolic acid during a slow process of drying out. Other types of wood were preserved in water. Objects made of iron were dried and then cooked in paraffin to prevent rusting. Bronze articles were dried and then lacquered. Rope was treated with glycerin. Leather was oiled. Textile finds presented particular difficulties. The wool and silk had kept fairly well in the clay, but the linen had coagulated into a layered cake which proved almost impossible to separate. Gustafsson, meanwhile, had embarked on a fact-finding tour of European museums, visiting his colleagues and consulting them on the latest techniques of preservation. He returned with the idea of saturating the wood in a solution of alum and water. Afterwards the alum was washed off the outside and the wood allowed to dry. The alum inside crystallized and bulked out the wood, giving it structure and preventing shrinkage. Once dry it was coated with linseed oil and a layer of matte lacquer apply. The technique was the best then available to Gustafsson. With the passage of time, however, the alum has assumed a wafer-like consistency that leaves the wood delicate and difficult to handle, and highly sensitive to variations in temperature and humidity. If change occurs too rapidly the crystallization process in the alum will reverse and the wood burst. After treatment it proved possible to use over 90% of the original oak in the reconstructed keel, as well as over half the iron nails used by the builders of the ship, both for and aft ship posts, and the tiller had been twisted out of shape, and there were anxious moments for the restorers as these were steamed and subjected to pressure from the braces, but these techniques, too, proved successful. The stern post the upper part of which was found in a break and shaft dug at an unknown time by gravel robbers, did not survive exposure to the air, 
the only wholly new part of the restored ship. It was designed as a dragon's tail to match the dragon's head of the forepost. Using as a guide images such as the invasion ships depicted on the Bayo Tapestry from Discovery in 1902, completed reconstruction in 1926. The restoration project took 22 years. A new museum was purpose-built for the three ships on the Big D Peninsula a mile or so from the center of Oslo, and on the 27th of September 1926, the Osberg ship was packaged in a frame of iron and would before being mounted on a specially adapted railway wagon to begin its slow journey from the university. Workshops at Frederiksgate 3 to the docks at Pipervika. The wagon was dragged through the streets of Oslo on railway tracks laid by a team of soldiers. After every 100 meters, the cortege came to a halt as the tracks were retrieved from behind the wagon, carried forward and relayed in front of it. Large crowds of sightseers turned out to watch. Security precautions were hiling to fears of vandalism from the disturbed or drunken. At Pipervika the ship was transferred onto a barge for the short distance over the water to Digdi. There the rail laying process continued as the ship was dragged up the slope of Huck Avenue to the museum, where she joined the two Nangoxted ships in 1948. As a gesture of respect and, in the presence of the King of Norway, the bones of the two women whose deaths had started the whole train of events over 1,000 years previously were ceremonially reinter in granite sarcophagi in the reconstructed mound at Slagen. If the Osberg ship coffin and its contents were all the archaeological evidence we had of the Viking Age and its culture we would still be fortunate. For the range and quality of the items buried with the two women far outstripped the grave goods found in the other burials for sheer artistic merit and in terms of the amount of practical information they provide about the lives, ways and beliefs of the Vikings. Gustafsson and his team of archaeologists, diggers, engineers and restorers left a compendious record of every detail of the excavation. In combination with modern techniques of scientific analysis, provides enough information to permit a reconstruction of the possible sequence of events surrounding the burial. Dendrochronological analysis shows that the Osberg shit was built from trees felled in 820. Her hull was 22 meters long and 5 meters broad and made of 12 overlapping oak planks, secured to each other with iron nails, a technique known to boat builders as clinker building. Nine timbers formed the hull, the larger tent marked the water line, and the two upper timbers the sides, tiller, or zan mast were of pine wood. The narrow and elegant lines of her bow originally led to an assumption that she was probably some sort of royal yacht used for traveling locally in the sheltered waters of the Oslo Roar. A recent electronic skin has revealed, however, that the horizontal ribs on either side of the reconstructed keel should have been curved and not straight. At the cost of elegance the broader bow would have made her quite capable of sailing on the open. Cease. Dendrochronological analysis has established that her active life ended in the spring of 834, when her presumptive owner died. Some historians believe that the Viking practice of burying their dead leaders in large mounds that were close to the family home reflected the significance of the mounds as a visible broadcast of the family's power. In that case the Osberg Mound is an exception, for its location has been described as almost actively anti-monumental, possibly in a deliberate attempt to exploit the preservative properties of the clay. Low-lying ground to the east of the stream at Slagen was preferred to the higher ground just a couple of hundred meters north of it, and unlike the complex of mounds at nearby Bor, for example, which functioned as a burial ground from about 600 to 650 until well into the Viking Age, this was an isolated construction. At that time the road lay about one kilometer further south than it does today, and the ship had to be dragged from the boathouse up the stream until that became too narrow, then hauled up on land and dragged on wooden rollers the rest of the way across the field to the long furrow which had been dug to receive it. The clay-type soul from the furrow was heaped up nearby on the grass, incidentally preserving the meadow flowers beneath it, from which it has been deduced that the furrow was cut in the spring. Once the ship was in position, facing south and toward the roar, a ten-shaped oak shelter was built behind the mast to house the dead women. The whole community must have been engaged in the process at this time. Craftsmen working on the ornaments and household objects that were to accompany them into the grave, others digging the peat with which the mound was to be covered, still others breaking and transporting boulders from the rocky outcrop that lay northeast of the mound. The after part of the ship, between the gravicamber and the stern post, was loaded with what the passengers would need on their voyage. 
small axes and knives, cooking equipment, and a whole ox and the whole then covered by a layer of boulders, beds, white woolen blankets with red patterns, down quilts, clothing, pots and buckets of various sizes, a weaving tablet with a half-woven piece of cloth in it, as well as other pieces of weaving mat, perhaps originally hung as strip decorations on the walls of the chamber, and many other items were carried into the burial chamber behind the mast. The ship was then partially buried, starting from the stern, continuing up to and framing the triangular entrance to the grave chamber behind the mast, at which point sole analysis shows that work stopped. If one of the two women was a slave fated to serve her mistress in the next life, as in this then now was perhaps the point at which she would have been sacrificed, the two were ceremoniously carried on board and placed on the beds inside the chamber, and the entrance boarded up with surprising carelessness and lack of attention to detail, perhaps a hint that the consumption of alcohol in quantity may have formed part of the ritual. More valuable and ornate gifts were then loaded on board, again seemingly haphazardly including a beautifully carved ceremonial wagon and three sledges with shafts indicating that they were to be drawn by two horses, a gangway, oars, rigging, rope, baler, five metal rattles, of which one was attached to one of the animal head posts inside the burial chamber, a beechwood saddle, combs and wooden buckets, the handle of one bucket, the Buddha bucket, was decorated with two beautiful bronze figures seated, in the lotus position with eyes closed and, for yellow enamel swastikas decorating their chests, the tops of their skulls had been neatly sliced off, originally thought to hint at trade relations, with Asia. A recent theory suggests they may be representations of 7th century Celts, who had been ritually sacrificed, desiccated and then buried to function as tribal messengers to the gods, all in all. The wealth of material buried with this ship, to say nothing of the ship itself, was such as to make it hard to imagine the loss was not felt in the community sponsoring the Daryl. Now, with the chamber boarded up, came what was probably the heart of the proceedings. Four or five dogs and two more oxen were slaughtered, as well as fifteen horses that had first been run to exhaustion. The furniture, tools and carriages scattered across the foredeck were bathed in their blood. Stones were then piled over the ship breaking many of the grave goods and rendering them unusable. The sights and sounds accompanying such an orgy of bloodletting we might perhaps be able to imagine. The atmosphere conjured by it probably not, as the mourners then set about completing the mount. The sight before them must have been neary and inspiring. The blood-spattered ship with its cargo of dead women seeming to lurch forward across the field in a last attempt to shake off the engulfing wave of dark earth rising behind it. The meadow flowers preserved from this stage of the proceedings were autumnal, showing that the whole process from the opening of the furrow to the closing of the mound must have taken about for months. Clearly at least one of the women had died long before the burial took place. It is hardly possible to conceive of a society that is not curious about the possibility of the life after death. The saga of the Joms Vikings, a story first written down about 1200, contains a scene in which a number of warriors sit on the beach awaiting their turn to be executed, after defeat in a sea battle at Hurongavik, off the coast of Norway, in about 986. One recalls with his neighbor their conversations on the subject of life after death, and tells him he intends to use his execution as the occasion of an experiment to find out if such a thing exists. When his turn comes he grasps a knife in his hand and tells the executioner that, if he is able to, he will hold up the blade, after his execution as a signal that he is still conscious. Thorkel Hugh, the sagaman relates remorselessly, the head flew off, and the knife dropped, on the other side of the Viking world from Oesberg and the Norwegian Vestfold, and about a century later, the Arab diplomat and Islamic teacher Ibn Fadlan noted down his detailed description of the rites surrounding the cremation of a Viking chieftain on the banks of the Volgo, which he witnessed in 921. A slave girl had been chosen to join her master in his death. They led the slave girl to a thing that they had made which resembled a doorframe. She placed her feet on the palms of the men and they raised her up to overlook this frame. She spoke some words and they lowered her again. A second time they raised her up and she did again what she had done. Then they lowered her. They raised her a third time and she did as she had done. The two times before. Then they brought her a hen. She cut off the head, which she threw away and then they took the hen and put it in the ship. I asked the interpreter what she had done. He answered, the first time they raised her she said, behold, I see my father and mother. The second time she said, I see all my dead relatives seated. The third time she said, 
I see my master seated, in paradise and paradise is beautiful and green. With him are men and boy servants, he calls me. Take me to him. Saxo Grammaticus in the Gesta Danorum described a similar use being made of a cockerel as a medium or spirit messenger during a journey through the kingdom of death undertaken by a hero named Hating, with a female companion. Moving on, they found barring their way a wall, difficult to approach and surmount. The woman tried to leap over it, but to no avail, for even her slender, wrinkled body was no advantage. She thereupon ran off the head of a cock which she happened to be carrying and threw it over the enclosing barrier. Immediately the bird, resurrected, gave proof by a loud crow that it had truly recovered its breathing. Was it the observed tendency of hens to run around in a wild parody of continued existence, after decapitation that lay behind their role, in such situations? Was something similar done in connection with the O's bird burial, we can hardly know, because Viking Age Scandinavians had only a rudimentary written culture, in the form of terse runic inscriptions on stones and sticks and because knowledge of heathen rites and beliefs was actively suppressed by the church after the triumph of Christianity, our ignorance of what these people believed about first and last things, and of how these beliefs manifested themselves in practice, is considerable. Here at last, in the form of the Osberg ship, was a time capsule from the Viking Age, free from the taint of the creative imagination of the novelists, dramatists, painters and composers who had previously tried to describe it, but how was its wealth of material to be interpreted? What did it all mean? Stones were piled onto the ship. Was this to prevent the dead from walking again, or to sink the ship to a level at which the voyage to the next world might begin? And if the ship was to start out on such a voyage, why then anchor her by a doubled rope at the bow to a very large boulder, who was to cast her off, who was to sail her, and where to? Why were many of the oars on board bundled and unfinished? What logical or magical purpose was served by the decapitation of all fifteen horses that went into the grave? Why had a shaft been cut into the mound not long after it was closed? Was there in fact a ritual purpose behind the apparently haphazard disordering of the women's bones that were found in the shaft? A disappointment for the first students of the Osbur discovery was that only two samples of runic writing appeared among the artifacts. One was a faint label carved on the outside of a pinewood bucket that has been interpreted as, meaning Sigrid owns me. The other was on a cylindrical piece of wood, tentatively identified as part of an or an inscribed littleism, interpreted by some renologists as Lydial this mar or man is little wise, if correct. The interpretation is apt, for while the find conveyed an extraordinary amount of new information about the Vikings, the very richness of it took away the certainties of ignorance and raised as many questions as it answered about the nature of heathen spiritual beliefs and the larger culture of which they formed a part. Our task in the next chapter must be to try to reconstruct a general outline of this culture of northern heathendom, which was in so many essentials distinct from the Christianity that had become, by the end of the 8th century, the dominant culture across mainland Europe.